All right, so we are going to be in John chapter 8, 31 through 59 today. So we're going to be closing out um, John chapter 8. So this has been a big chapter, action-packed, right? Jesus has been teaching. He's been interrupted a few times. He's in the temple. Mixed crowd is there. They brought him the woman caught in adultery. We got to see that, um, that beautiful interaction, right? How he speaks truth into her life but he's still so kind and tender with her and compassionate, but he doesn't stray away from speaking truth, right? We really talked through that, go and sin no more, um, but he treats her with grace and compassion. We got to that second I am statement. I am the light of the world. And we really unpacked that in great detail, but the big takeaway for me, and I was even, I even went back to that a little bit this morning was um, it's more about where we walk than how we walk, right? When we walk in the light, it's more about where we walk than how we walk. And we talked through that in great detail, right? We're walking the light, the light exposes and yeah, we're sinful. <laughs> Big whoop, God knows it. But he calls us to follow him and walk in the light with all of our sin and all of our flaws and all of our yuck. And he don't care, he loves us. Mm -hmm. He calls us to the light, into the light. It's more about where we walk than how we walk, right? Um, yeah, we're sinful, but John 1, God is light. We walk in the light, being honest with God and honest with ourselves about our sins, and he cleanses us daily. And we talked through yesterday in great detail, 1 John um, chapter 1, really 5 through 9. We don't lie to ourselves anymore. We don't act like we don't have any sin, right? We don't we we lie to ourselves if we act like we don't have sin. We don't try to hide it from God. We confess and we let the Lord deal with us and stay walking in the light. And then that sweet part yesterday, that kind of leads us into that theme. We, we were talking a lot about picking up themes, right? If then, if then, if you, John 8, 12 says, if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness anymore. I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, then you never have to walk in darkness again. And for those of us that know darkness, we, we know what darkness is, right? And so that's a sweet promise. So we choose where we choose to walk. That's on us. That's our responsibility. We, we absolutely have choice every step of the way. And so that's kind of what yesterday was all about. Those people were rejecting him. They were rejecting his message. And he clearly lays out where those choices will lead. Um, you know, choices have consequences. And we're gonna see a lot of these kind of if then statements from Jesus. If you walk in the light, then you never have to walk in darkness again. Yesterday, verse 24, if you don't believe that I am who I say I am, then you will die in your sin. If you don't believe, and that's a different kind of consequence, right? Mm -hmm. um, our choices lead to consequences both positive and negative, our choices have outcomes. And so they lived in darkness because they refused to walk in the light. And yesterday he really laid that out. And so that thought leads us into today's reading where we're gonna pick up and we have a lot to unpack. So I wanna get right into it. John chapter eight, verse 31. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching. And so here we are, same teaching. He Remember, he had been teaching to a mixed crowd for this whole sermon in the temple, and he was interrupted by the religious leaders. He's addressing the, he was yesterday addressing those with unbelieving hearts. And now he starts talking to those who believe in him, the believing Jews. And remember where we left off that thought yesterday, um, it said that there was, many who believed in him after all the things that he said. And we, we talked yesterday at the end about the, how the crowd was divided and how that's okay, right? Usually when Jesus starts laying out truth, the crowd is always going to probably be divided on where they land. And that is okay. We need to get comfortable with that. We need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It is okay that Jesus divides it's okay. Not everyone is going to accept truth. Do we want them to? Yeah. Do we want them to accept the truth that the gift of salvation is for them? Is for Yes. We want it. We want it desperately, right? But the reality is not everyone will. And so 
that's okay. That's on them. It's not on us. We can't want it for them more than they want it for themselves. And sometimes we do, we do so desperately, right? I think about my family. I think about my friends. I think about people that I love. I want it for them so bad, but you can't make them take it. You can't make them take it. And so he starts to talk about what it really means to be a disciple. And King James version of that says, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciple. It's very clear if then. And so if is a conditional statement, right? If implies choice. If you do this, then this is true. If you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciple. And so you're going to hear us say this a million times. What is a disciple? A follower, a, follower, a disciplined one, someone who's a student, someone who is learning. Yes. Thank you, class. We're awake today. Good job. Yeah. A disciplined one, a student, someone who follows closely. Um, if you're disciplining your life, you're learning from someone. To be someone's disciple means you're you're learning from them, you're following them, right? And so, gosh, wow, I really can't read without my glasses. It's sad. I'm old. Welcome. Don't get old, people. I feel like, and then once you get these ones, these fancy ones that have the readers inside, your eyes just get worse and worse and worse. You really can't read without them. Okay, anyway, sorry about that. Okay. So if I am following, what does that imply? I'm a disciple, but it, if I'm following, that means that he's leading, Yeah. right? Can I be leading and be following at the same time? That's just not possible. It's not possible. So if I'm following, that means he's leading. That means what? He dictates where we go, right? If, if, if he's in front, I'm in back. If he's leading, I'm following. So this is really great timing, fresh off of, you know, where am I walking? Am I walking in the light? Because if he's leading, I'm following. He dictates where we walk. Is he going to lead me into darkness? No. No. I'm sorry, what? Okay. Yeah. Remember, it's not how we walk, but where we walk. If I'm letting him lead, he is going to lead me into light. He leads me into good pastures. I mean, there's over and over. He's the lamp to guide my feet and a light to my path. Over and over and over again, the Bible talks about him being a good shepherd and he leads us to good places. And so something that's a good question for us to ask ourselves, am I, am I good at following? Am I a good follower? You know, because we all know what it's like to follow the wrong thing, don't we? Right? I was thinking this morning about some of my past mistakes and how, you know, I would follow the wrong man to hell and back because I love him. Oh, I love, I'm in love. I love him. He's the one, he's my soulmate. Right? And I will follow him into felony charges. I will follow, take the rap for him. I'm not snitching on him. I'm still paying restitution right now for a man that convinced me we were Bonnie and Clyde. And then he he left with the bag, baby. He left with the bag while I sat in jail and then still didn't snitch on him. How about that? We will follow the wrong man to hell and back for love. Right? Who never really, really does anything for us, but leave us high and dry, empty, broken, torn to pieces, you know, you know, we will follow the drugs, the dope man, the money to our own destruction, won't we? So we do know how to follow, don't we? We follow the wrong things for a long time. So we know how to be committed to things that are hurtful for us or harmful for us. And so we do have the ability, we just need to kind of shift that energy right? Transferable skills, ladies. We need to shift that energy onto the one who gives us life. Why? Why? Because in verse 32, he says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Because not only does he give us life, but he promises us freedom, 
right? And so what is he saying? He's saying a lot. He's saying a lot. And actually I got stuck here this morning. Peg texts me. It was like 7.30. Now I've been up since five. Okay. In this since five, 7.30, she texts me. She's like, I'm so jealous that you get to teach this today. I was like, I'm only on verse 32. I'm stuck in freedom. I'm in an ocean. I'm drowning in an ocean of freedom. Thinking about all my bondage and all the things that he sent me free from. I can't get past verse 32. Mm -hmm. I'm drowning. Okay. Because there's a lot, it's so much here. What's he saying, right? Being a true disciple looks like something. It is a life that is committed not only to Jesus, because yeah, Jesus is the main thing. And we love savior. We love wash me, make me white as snow. Take me, you know, I love all that warm, squishy, right? Don't get me wrong, but being a true disciple, King James version, continuing in the word, it, it means being committed to the word, right? Continuing in a lifestyle of learning his word, studying it, letting it change us from the inside out because the word of God really is what does all the heavy lifting. It's like, you guys come here, right? Just like I came, I, I think I told Peg the other day on the phone, I got a Lauren Wong in here. I got a Lauren Wong week one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because the word, the word of God, I got, I, the word of God is what changed me. You guys come here and sometimes we're messy. You know, we got a lot going on in our hearts and in our minds. And it's like, everyone's like, oh my gosh, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm not going to do anything. We're just going to keep on serving the word, teaching the word and trusting the Lord that he's going to change her that his word is going to transform her heart mm -hmm. from the inside out. We're just going to love her. Just going to love her where she's at. And yeah, the structure and the rules and the greenhouse, right? It helps. It definitely helps speed up the process, right? Because where else do you get to go and be completely undistracted by everything that's going on out there and just get spoon fed the word three times a day, 24 seven in an environment where you get to have all, it's a greenhouse. It's not a bubble. It's a greenhouse. What does a greenhouse do? It speeds up the growth of the flowers. What is the word? It's food. It's fertilizer, healthy soil, right? Good meals, good music, good fellowship. None of that poison that's out there. Filthy language. We're going to talk about all the things that you got to put off and put on. Here's a good place where you got, when you come in here right away, we're like, you can't have this. You can't have that. You can't have, we're going to just put that in the basement for you. We'll lock that up. You can have it when you leave, right? You can't have this. You got it. We help you put it off. And we tell you what to put on here in the greenhouse, right? But God's word is what does all the heavy lifting. I don't need to change you. We don't change you. The program doesn't change you. This is what changes you. The word of God, Jesus, a relationship with him is what changes you. And so we come into this relationship where we're committed and submitted. Don't miss that. Committed and submitted right? And we allow the word to lead and dictate our lives. Why? Because you know what? There's going to be times where we come to things in here that we don't like. There's going to be times where we come. What's submitted? Like submission, like surrender, like when authority, like under authority, when you're submitted to authority. So I am submitted to the authority of the word of God. I, like when we first come to the Lord, we want to align our heart and our lives to what God's word says to his authority, right? And so a good picture of that is when you come here, everything we do, like the authority structure is to prepare you for when you go out there. Because when you go out there, you're not going to have somebody standing over you all day, every day. The idea is that your heart will be submitted to God and to his word. These here, this here is just preparing you to leave here and be truly submitted to the Lord. Cause you're, I'm not going to be in your pocket telling you what to do when you leave out of here. The hope is that you'll have a real relationship with Jesus. And here you just have practical examples of people helping you learn the principle of submission and authority, the, the authority structure and the principle of that. Understand? Okay. So, um, listen, there's going to be times where we come to things in his word that we do not like. There's going to be times where we read things, right? And it's like, it's not going to line up with what we want, what we want to do. And maybe the Lord says no, or the Lord says thou shall not, right? Just like, you know, when I first came to the Lord and you read that stuff in there that says no sex before marriage, you know, and you're like, oh yeah, okay. All this other stuff is good. Jesus is my savior, but like, I don't like that. Like, I'm not going to do that. That's not, 
he's good and everything. I'm trying to get clean, but I'm not trying to get celibate. <laughs> Silly. That's stupid. <laughs> right? Well, eventually, as you walk with him and as he, mm -hmm. you fall in love with him and he changes your heart, mm -hmm. our hearts, right? Like Philippians 2.13 says, God is working in you to change your desires to do what pleases him. Like he works in us. He changes our heart. And one day you just wake up and you're like, I want to be pure on my wedding day. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You just wake up one day and he did it. Like he does it in you when you're not even paying attention. Like he does it. He does the heavy lifting. We don't come in day one, week one, month one, year one, being like, yes, I'm ready, you know, to do all these hard things. It doesn't happen that way. But the hope is that, you know, when we come to these hard things that we read, or if he says no for praying about something and he clearly is like, no, right? And it's like, well, how come God, why not? Like, I don't get it, why can't I? right? That's when we come to this place in our lives where it's like, you know what? It doesn't matter if I understand or not. You're the Lord. You're my Lord. And I trust you. You're my creator. You created my heart. You know what's good for me. And if you say no, I got to trust that you, you know something that I don't know. You know, you know my future. You got the big, you got the big view, you know, the parade view. He sees everything. And I got to trust that, you know, what's going to actually satisfy me. And this, this might be something that's bad for me. And so if we can get to that place where we're committed and submitted and we can take his nose and we can, you know, I'm telling you, it's a much better place. I guarantee if we start to live our lives this way, allowing this book to dictate our actions, we will usually in hindsight after the fact, because in the moment we're like, oh, that's fine. I'm just going to do it. That's fine. God said, okay. Right. It, usually we don't like it when it's happening, but it's like, I'm obeying. Okay. I'm obeying. Right. <laughs> we, we, it's okay. He loves that. He honors that. Right. Usually we do the action first and our heart follows. We just do the action because he says, right? We don't have to feel the feelings. We just do the action because he says, okay, Lord, you said, no, that's fine. I'm just going to do what you say. And then later the, the feelings come and the peace comes when we take the steps of faith. And then, right, usually in hindsight, we learn the wisdom of God's word. We grow, right? And we learn, oh, okay, that's why you you turned me left. You were, you were, oh, you turned me a big... You know what I mean? I heard one time, um, God's path is rarely like the shortest distance. Mm -hmm. It's a windy road, but there's guardrails mm -hmm. and we always want to get there fast. And we're like, Oh God, why? Huh, huh, right. But we got to trust his plan and we want what we want when we want it. Right. But he's taken us usually on a long journey, but it's with protection and it's with guardrails. And when we just want to, we had someone go off the cliff, hurt, pain, consequences, right? And it's like, okay, well, he just picks us up. He dusts us off. No failure in God's economy. Do over. He starts us back at the beginning, like a video game. Do, 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 do. Here we go, right? <laughs> okay, well, it's like, okay, how are you going to do it this time? Are you going to go slow and follow the path? Are you going to be like, okay, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? We have a choice every time, choices. If, then, if, then, you know? And so and one thing too, it's like, we will see the sad results, usually destruction of people who totally disregard God's word over and over and over again, bottom of the cliff. Okay. Bottom of the cliff. And, you know, I had this season recently where I was like, Oh, how do I guard my heart against like, when I see destruction coming and I'm like, don't do it. And I used to be the type of person that used to run and tackle them. And I'd be like, okay, if you get a little bit hurt in the process and I get hurt too, at least I saved you from going off the cliff, right? If you get your knees scraped and you're mad at me for telling you the truth, at least I saved you from going off the cliff. No, I had someone very wise tell me, no, if you see destruction coming, maybe God is just preparing your heart mm -hmm. to pray and just in getting your heart ready for somebody that you love going over the cliff. People don't want to hear unless they invite your counsel. You know, and I said, well, what do you do when the same people keep going off the cliff over and over and over again? How do you guard your heart when you love them? And they keep doing the same thing, stupid, over and over and over again. And then they're at the bottom of the cliff, like, help me, Lord, help me. 
church or help me, help me. And you're like, and, and what did Jesus say? 70 times seven. You love them. You pick them back up. You brush them up. You put them at the start and say, here we go again. You just love them. You love them. It's so hard, right? It's hard, but you do it. That's what Jesus does. But listen, one thing I also want to say is there's nothing that God says don't do that is good for us. I promise. I promise. Right? Nothing God says don't do that is good for us. And the issue is for most of us humans, we fall into these bad habits like slowly and over time. And it's like that picture <laughs> of the frog in the boiling water. And like, you know, you he's swimming in the pot and then slowly over time, it starts boiling hotter and hotter and hotter. And then it's like, you don't realize that it pulls us away from God, these habits that we have. And it pulls us away from this biblical eternal mindset and more on this kind of worldly instant gratification path. Right. But if we can just pause for a second and zoom out, usually we can see things more clearly. And when we're in the word, like it says, if you are my disciple, you continue in my word. It's a continual, right? Continue. It's a journey. It's a process to remain. Think of it like a lifelong commitment to be a disciple and choose to look at the word, right? To look to the word daily for guidance, encouragement, correction, instruction. When we have that type of relationship with the Lord, where we're seeking him daily, he tells us about ourselves. He, he reveals our own wicked hearts to us, right? If you do then you are and here's the contrast of that if you don't then you're not ouch right if you do then you are if you don't then you're not and i love what pastor tom always says he's like listen if i don't read my bible for four days i'm right back to the world four days is all it takes four days in a row of not reading my bible i'm right back who i used to be we gotta do this you guys we need to it's life or death for us and so pretty simple there's lots of believers in the world right but the Great Commission says what? Do you guys know what the Great Commission is? That's the purpose of life. But the Great Commission says, go into all the world and make disciples. It doesn't say go into all the world and make believers. Right? It says make disciples. Right? Believers is great. Warm, squishy, savior. But Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. And he says, if you want to be my disciple, continue in my word. He wants people to be close to him, to study, to grow, to have that type of relationship with him. You know, he doesn't just want Sunday Christians. I mean, don't get me wrong. We want people to get saved, but you can have a saved soul and a wasted life right? Not us. Let's not be that guys. And so Jesus said, go make disciples. What does that tell us? He wants us to be committed continually to his word, the source. Why? So we will know truth. Like verse 32 says, John 14, six. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the No one comes to the Father except through me. Does it say that on yours? No? Okay. Well, I think it should, right? Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> he is the truth, right? <clears throat> they have these signs or these t-shirts. I feel like we should make them. <clears throat> Sorry, I have like a tickle in my throat. And they say, no, Jesus, K-N-O-W, no truth. Mm -hmm. And then the back says, no, Jesus, no truth. N-O, Jesus, N-O, truth. No, Jesus, no truth. No, Jesus, no truth. Right? Because he is the truth. She said, that's good. <laughs> yeah, right? I feel like we should make those, right? That would be cool. And so when we come to know Jesus, we come to know truth. Why? Because he is the truth. And so here's one of those Huddle ocean statements. No Jesus, no truth. We come to know Jesus, we come to know truth. Great. Why? Because he is the truth. Yeah. Great. Well, there's the puddle. Okay. Well, here's the ocean. Okay. Here's one of those statements that we can drown in. The truth sets us free. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sets us free from sin and death, sets us free from bondage. When we know Jesus, we are set free. There's the puddle. Okay. Well, here's the ocean. This is 
the truth, the Bible, the word of God is the truth, right? The, the world tells us that there is no such thing as absolute truth, that truth is relative, live your truth. My truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. This is my truth. That's not true. <laughs> that is crap. There is a such thing as absolute truth. It's right here. This is truth. The word is truth. Jesus Christ says he is the word made flesh. And if we know Jesus, we know truth. And this is truth right here. We do have a source of truth, of absolute truth. Why do you think the world doesn't want to acknowledge that this is true? Because it means that they have to look at it. it means that we got to look at ourselves, right? Look at our sin. Come into the light. Be exposed, right? We do have a source of truth, right? And so every word of it is true. Psalm 119, 160. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to mute so I can do a good. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Olivia. Yeah. <laughs> um, the very essence of your words is truth. All your regulations will stand forever. Amen. Some other translations say the sum of your word is true. All of it in total, in totality, the sum of your word is truth. True freedom is found there right? The answers to all of life's issues are found here, right? And so Deuteronomy 32, 47, I think I gave that to somebody there also at Reno. Okay, let's come in. Good morning. Good morning. These instructions are not empty words. They are your life. By obeying them, you enjoy a long life in the land you occupy when you cross the Jordan River. Amen. These instructions are not just empty words. They are your life. Whoa. True freedom is found in the word. The answers to all of life issues are found in the word, right? This life that we live here, this life aligning our hearts and minds with God's word, asking him, praying that prayer when we first come to him, right? This is freedom. Understanding who I am in him, who he tells me I am, is freedom. My salvation, what Jesus did for me on the cross, knowing him and having a relationship with him, that is freedom. The truth sets us free, right? Free from what? The lies that we have been bathed in by the world. The lies that we have been bathed in by the enemy. The labels, the diagnoses, the whatever. The lies that we believe about ourselves. The lies that people have told us. The lies that the enemy torments us with. This is what sets us free. This is what restores our mind. This is what restores our soul, right? When, when Jesus set the demoniac free, what was he after that? Clothed and in his right mind, right? When we, when we really come to know him and the more we know him and the more we grow with him and grow in him, he heals our minds. He restores our mind. I watch it happen here every single day. And those of us that come out of a drug world or a drug past, I am telling you, I think that there is no more demonic drug than methamphetamine. And I have seen countless women come in in psychosis and it takes months. It takes months, but this is the answer. And you know, if you go out there for answers, they're gonna throw pills at you. They're gonna throw pills at you. They're gonna tell you, yeah, maybe it's drug-induced psychosis, but it's psychosis. And the answer for that is antipsychotics, yeah, right? But this truth, truth is what is the answer to lies. Light is the answer to darkness, right? God's presence dispels fear, right? 
Satan is a counterfeit artist. So everything that he does is the opposite. He twists truth. He twists and distorts reality. And so the answer to that is truth. Mm. It is reality. And so each one of you, I'm looking around this room and I'm thinking about people from the past. And I just know, I can't even count how many minds have been restored and made whole, how many lives, families, children, mothers, people who came in here. And I'm telling you, were telling me things that they believed were true. And I'm like, I believe that you believe that that is true. <laughs> I'm not questioning, right? But it is the psychosis. It's the, the enemy, because I believe that meth opens up a portal to the dark side. It's pharmakia, right? And the enemy loves to have that door cracked so he could stick his big toe in there, and just torment people, right? But the more you come here, or you come into any place of safety that is under the umbrella of the authority of God, of Jesus Christ and covered in his blood, right? And, and, and is teaching the word and serving the word and you get safety and protection and God restores mind and truth and minds and truth dispels lies and truth brings freedom from bondage to addiction, to mental health, to whatever, to self and sin, right? And so, you know, we could go so deep and on and on. And I'm not even, I went so deep this morning in my own personal time, you know, about what true freedom is. But I want to really say that what the world thinks is freedom is crap. What the world thinks is freedom is crap, right? The world thinks freedom is being able to do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. And that is a lie because that lifestyle of serving self actually leads to bondage. Mm -hmm. The more I give myself whatever I want, the more in bondage to self and sin and possessions and drugs and men and lust, the more in bondage to those things I am. And that's the biggest lie that Satan sells us. You need this. You want this. This is good for you. Did God really say those people are just trying to keep you from what you should have? This is a lie. This is control. That That is control. Whatever, right? That's a lie. Satan is the father of lies. That is why we need to know freedom to be, know truth to be set free, right? Think about it. Think about it. All of us in here know where that life leads. True freedom, true freedom is being able to say no to the, <clears throat> to the things that used to rule us, right? To be able to walk away from temptation, to be able to rule over my fleshly lusts and desires. True freedom is not being driven by anything, but being led daily by a loving savior, right? Sheep are led, cattle are driven. Think about that. Jesus described himself as a good shepherd. We are his sheep. Sheep are led, cattle are driven. Think about your sin life. It was like driven, driven, driven by my fleshly lusts and desires. God bless you every day. Driven, driven. A lot of it fell out of control. I got to, I must, I need this, I need this, right? I don't need anything. I don't even drink coffee. And I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying, whoa, look at God. Who would have ever thought that I could do that? I'm such an addict personality. I got to have it. I got to have it. Right. I wake up in the morning. I drink a bottle of water. So cool. God did that. You know, God can do that for all of us. We're led. We're not driven. And so we thought we did all those things before out of free will because we wanted to. But the truth is I never experienced true freedom in my life until Christ set me free. And I had the freedom to say no. And then I realized that all those years, I was actually being driven by the enemy. He's a cattle driver, right? And so you guys do know that we were created to worship, right? We have a worship disorder. That's why I think, does Ken say that? Somebody says that. We have a worship disorder. We just were worshiping the wrong things. We were created to worship. We are beings that were created to worship. And we will all worship something. We will either worship and serve God and be free, 
because the truth sets us mm. free and we will walk in the light or we will be slaves to self and sin, right? And so we're going to get into that as we can finally move on. So verse 33 says, but we're descendants of Abraham. They said, we've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free, right? And they're saying all of this. Um, what do you mean we're going to be set free? It's pride. Why? Pride blinds. They can't receive anything that he's saying. They don't, he's, he's off. He's like, listen, you know, I'm showing you the way to be true disciples, freedom, his heart for why he's pour, pouring this all out, just like us, right? He's like, I want you to come into this relationship. I don't want you to just be believers, right? And they're like, all full of pride. We are children of Abraham, <laughs> right? But they're self-deceived because why? Because pride blinds. Mm -hmm. We've never been slaves of anyone. Excuse me. They've they've been they've been slaves in their whole history. Egypt, Babylonians, Assyrians, like they have been slaves. What are they talking about? They're crazy. They're self-deceived and don't aren't we self-deceived when we're puffed up in pride? Mm -hmm. Again, we lie to ourselves more than anyone has ever lied to us or more than we've ever lied to anyone else, right? Mm -hmm. And so 34, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin and a slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. Yes, I realize that you are descendants of Abraham. And yet some of you are trying to kill me because there's no room in your hearts for my message. I'm telling you what I saw when I was with my father, but you are following the advice of your father. And so again, Jesus is speaking truth straight into the issue. He's like, you guys don't get what I'm saying, right? What I'm, what I'm trying to speak into what's going on with you is inside stuff. It's heart stuff, right? And he's saying, I'm, I'm addressing the condition of your hearts. He's trying to tell them the way to true freedom. I want to set you free. I want you to be free indeed, truly free. And he just went through all that to say, you know, I don't want you to just think you're good because you're believers, because you're children of Abraham. You know, the Jews thought because they because of their heritage, because they were born Jewish, that they were good. Right. And for this culture, that was a huge thing for them. Have you have you guys ever heard the saying that God doesn't have any grandchildren? OK, well, that's a saying. Right. Just because you're born into a Christian family or just because your parents take you to church doesn't mean you're good, right? Just because these Jews were born children of Abraham or just because these Jews are Jews by heritage doesn't mean they're right with God. You must be born again, Jesus said. We have to put our faith and trust personally, each one of us, in what Jesus did for us on the cross. Like that is important. We all have to choose him. We are all sinners. We all have a sin nature. We all have to be reborn into his family to be called his children. God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has children, period. And so that's important for us to know. And so they're so stuck. They don't understand their need to be set free. They don't even understand that they're slaves. And can't we get stuck sometimes? Don't we get stuck on what we think we know? Or yeah, Deborah's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> stuck. And we'll stay stuck too. I think Romans is the best place to really go because it takes us through our transformation from our sin life to our new life in him. And we don't have time for all of it, but in your free time, you should all read Romans six, seven, and eight. If you haven't read it yet, six, seven, and eight, read all the chapters. And we're going to go there. Um, Tina Lynn, you're not muted. Oh, you're going to read. You are yeah. going to, oh, you unmuted in preparation. Look at you. Good girl. Um, read Romans six, seven, and eight in your free time. But Tina Lynn today, please read first, just Romans six, six. Okay. Um, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Amen. So our old selves are crucified with Christ, right? We are set free, right? Because of his work on the cross. Now read 10 and 12. Okay. Uh, for the, for the death that he died, he died to sin once and for once, once for all. 
but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but also alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so we are dead to sin, but alive in Christ. And then verse 18. 18. Uh, let me find it. <laughs> um. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. Okay, that's it for 18. No longer uh, slaves yeah. to sin, and we are slaves mm -hmm. to righteousness. Okay, that's it. Great. Thank you for reading. Okay, so what's the point? We're set free by Jesus because of his work on the cross, right? We are no longer slaves to sin and we are slaves to righteousness instead, right? And what's the issue for them is that they don't even realize they're slaves. They don't even realize that they need to set free, be set free. Don't we all know people like that? Like I have family that are good people that are not Christians like I think of my dad all the time when I think of this, and it's like, I love him so much and I just want him to get saved, but he's a good person. And he's like, doesn't even know that he's a slave to his own self, right? Because he's a good person. It's easy for us who have lived lives of extreme bondage and darkness. Like we've tasted darkness. So we know, you know, when we come into the light, we're like, oh, yes thank you jesus forgiveness wash me like i need it i'm desperate but and that's why i always say like desperation is a gift desperation is a gift because it drives us to the foot of the cross it drives us to jesus and we know how much we need him we desperately need him but what about for the people that like these jews like maybe people in our lives that are good people that don't even know that they're slaves to sin that they're slaves to self they would never consider themselves a slave they're like what are you talking about you know it's easy for us to look at these jews and look down on them and think oh my gosh jesus is right in front of them how could they be so hard-hearted how could they be so blind how could they not be receiving what he's saying but when you think of it in the case of like my dad or like maybe people that you know that are just quote unquote good people you can kind of see how they would be like oh yeah duh like they don't recognize their need for jesus they're like that's good for you that's good for you my dad will tell anyone that will listen that jesus saved me he's like yeah she went to this christian rehab in maine it's great her church is great it's full of young people it's a great place it's a great he witnesses in the you know how many he has sent like three or four girls here because he'll he'll run in an old friend from high school or a friend or someone at the grocery store or at this place or that place and They'll start talking and their daughter will be struggling and he'll say, oh, well, my daughter, you should call my daughter, you know, and they can help get her into this program or da, 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 whatever. I'm not even kidding. Your cousin is a friend. Her mother is a friend of my mom's that worked at the hospital together. It's like, that's how this happens. Right. But it's so crazy. But is he, are, do either of them want to accept Christ? No, because they're good people. Right. They got it all together. And that's, the things like we can see easier now, it's harder for them to acknowledge their need. You know, but are they slaves to sin? Yes. To self, to selfishness. And so how do we, how do we minister to those people? Well, we pray, we pray on our face and on our knees that their eyes would be open to their own stuff. And then we live, we live it out loud. We let them see our changed lives sometimes are the biggest billboard. It's the biggest testimony. Whoa. Yeah. And we, and we stay consistent, you know, we make sure that they see that it's real. It's not a crutch. It's not just something that got us sober. Like it's really real, you know, and that's important. And then we just love them where they're at too. We make sure that we're not weird or judgmental. That's hard sometimes because we want everyone to get it. So it's like, I remember Peg, my first phone call home, I was like, you guys need to go to church and you guys need to do this and you need to do that. And Peg was like, you need to chill is what you need to do because you were shooting dope five minutes ago. And now you're like telling your family what they need to do. Like you need to just take several seats, ma'am, <laughs> you know? And so <laughs> it's like that. So anyway, so this is going on with these people. They don't realize they're need for 
him and um, he's right in front of their face, mm -hmm. but they're kind of believing, but they can't get over this hurdle of like that they're children of Abraham, you know? And so um, bringing it back to, you know, for us, um, what I was thinking about earlier when I was talking about the greenhouse thing and how we put off and we put on. <clears throat> and um, I was thinking a lot this morning about you guys and how like, it's not enough to just stop like when we were living in however we were living before, like that took up all day, right? <laughs> like all day to run, chase all day, right? It's, it's a full-time job, right? And so you don't come here or you don't come to the Lord or get saved because not everybody gets to go to a program. I have a good friend that got saved and God like just changed her right where she was at. And that happens. And that happened for Peg. Peg didn't go to a discipleship program. She changed, you know, and Debbie discipled her and she just showed up at church and like, then she started taking people into her house and, and God changes people right where they're at sometimes. And that's beautiful. The thing is like, you know, you don't just stop living your sin life, cold Turkey, and you have to fill your time with this, with his word, with people, with his presence. Right. And so, you know, he doesn't just say, stop doing this. He says, stop doing this and start doing this don't do this instead do this. Right. And actually, as a matter of fact, I'm going to help you. I'm going to put people in your life. Peg had Debbie. When you're here, we come alongside of you. Right. My friend Heather had Diane and then she started, she had uncle Tommy and then she started showing up at missing peace. And then she had me and then she was, you know, we, God brings people alongside of you to walk the journey with you, to point you to him, to point you to his word. And that's what this place is about. That's what these places are about people that are invested in you that want to do the long journey with you. And so Galatians 4, 22 through 32, because he's like, Hey, we're going to walk the journey with you. God's going to bring people into your life to walk a journey with you. But his word is what's going to do the heavy lifting. And it's like, you got to throw off and you got to put on. For it is written that Abraham had two no, sons. Galatians, Galatians 4, 22 4. through 32 Galatians. Yeah, I'm just trying to four, four, 22, 22. No, that's not right. <laughs> that's not right. Is it Ephesians? Where am I going, Peg? Put off and put on. I need a help. I need a concordance. You're going to Ephesians 4 or Colossians. Oh, Ephesians. Yeah, it's Ephesians, Ephesians 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. <laughs> Uh, is it 22 through yeah, I it's looked it up yeah I think it's okay, 20. 20, 22 through 32 okay. hmm. that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness therefore putting away lying let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. You said 32? Yep. Okay. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Okay. So it's a lot, right? But it's very informative. And Paul says there, Hey, don't do this, do this, stop doing this, start doing this, put off this, put on this. Right. And Hey, you know what? In, in there, there is an act of our will required put off, put on, like throw off actually. And so Jesus is clearly like, Hey, I want to set you free. He's telling us he wants to set us free. And so the question that I asked, and then I want to ask you guys, is like, do we want to be free? 
Do we want to be free? Because the truth is sometimes we love our sin, don't we? I know when I first came to the program, I was grieving my sin. I was in love with my drug. I was grieving. I loved it. And that's why I was suicidal because I didn't think that I could ever live without it. I was actually suicidal. I tried to kill myself four times in the last year because I didn't think that I could live without. I knew it was killing me. I knew I was destroying my family, but I didn't think that I could live without it. And that's why I was trying to kill myself. And so the Lord healed me and healed all that. Right. But I had to come to the place where I was like, I hated it because he will deliver us from our enemies, but he won't deliver us from our friends. And as long as we love it, he can't set us free from it. If we're holding on to it, he can't take something that we're clinging to. Right. And so first we need to realize, right. That we're a slave to it and it's killing us. So that's first things first. Cause sometimes when we love it, we don't even realize that we're a slave to it. We're trying to justify it. We try to find ways to make it work. Don't we? How many times have we were like, okay, I'm just going to drink on the weekends. I'm just going to have two glasses of wine after work. I am going to just, this is my just smoking weed program. I am going to, this is, uh, I'm allowed to have seven Xanax a week. <laughs> um, you know, however, we try all these ways to like make it work because we love it. We don't, you know, and then we don't know that we're whatever. And so we got to get there first and, and foremost. And so also the thing that's important before we move on is that he does set us free. You know, he sets us free on the cross from hell. He sets us free right? He sets us free from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. We talked about this. His spirit living inside of us is the most powerful thing in this entire universe. And we never have to yield to, when we yield to our flesh and we engage in sin, willful rebellion and disobedience, that's an act of our will. When his spirit lives inside of us, we don't ever have to do that again. He set us free from the power of sin in our lives. We're not victims to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's an act of our will when we yield to our flesh. Please remember that. Okay. But he doesn't always free us from the consequences of our sin, does he? Sometimes we got to walk through those. I had probation for many years. I thought I was going to prison when I got out of the program. God saved me from that. So sometimes he's merciful and gracious and he saves us from consequences, but other times he doesn't. My husband had to go to prison, but God was merciful. He was facing 10. He got four. He only did two and a half. He got out on parole. Like God is good. There's many different situations, but sometimes he, we have to walk through consequences. And I just want, I know I didn't even get through all of this, but um, I got stuck, but, and I want to back up quick. I don't want to miss verse 37. They are literally trying to kill him because verse 37, King James version says, my word has no place in your hearts. Let's not ever get there. How about we don't ever get there because as a Christian, right, we don't ever want to get to the place where we don't have room for his word and in our hearts. They are trying to kill him because his, his word has no place in this heart. And so heart check, you know, what's in my heart. And so moving on, I'm just going to wrap it up really quickly here because I am out of time, but this is like Peg does a really great teaching on this. Who's your daddy? And I know she's going to talk here at the end, so I'm not going to do too much, but he closes out this chapter really saying that, you know, um, I'm telling you that when I was with my father and then he goes, you're trying to kill me because you are imitating your real father. And then he says, you would love me because I've come to you from God. I'm not here on my own, but he who sent me, but you can't hear me. We don't want to miss that either. You can't hear me. You love to do the evil things he does. Your father is the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. He always hated the truth. There is no truth in him. Anyone who belongs to God, I'm skipping down to 47. Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God, but you don't listen because you don't belong to God. And I did give out some verses, but we don't have time. But here's the, here's the deal. Satan is the father of lies. His language is lies, right? What we, 
it's it's God the Father versus Satan. If we were to make two columns, we could look at the characteristics of God the Father. We could look at characteristics of Satan. We could pick through the scripture and we could clearly lay it out. And maybe we can do that after we end the Zoom. We can talk through it. But the reality is that we take on the traits of our parents, whether we like it or not. We are like them. You are like the people who raised you, whether you like it or not. I have some of the best traits of my parents and some of the worst traits of my parents. Okay, there are things that I hate about myself that is, are just like them and things that I love about myself that I got from them. And so it's just that simple. And so if you were to do those two columns, right? And and some of the things about Satan, you know, he's a liar, he's sneaky, he's a manipulator, he's a twister, he sets traps, he tempts, he's an accuser. And then you you make the column about God, he's faithful, he's, he's true, he speaks the truth. And you just ask yourself, like, who do I look like? Who do I look more like? When we lie, we are speaking Satan's language. He's the father of lies. When we lie, we are speaking the language of the father of lies. And so when we lie, we look more like our daddy, the devil, than our daddy, God. And so I always say, because this is a direct quote from Peg, who's your daddy? <laughs> when we get to this point, it's John chapter eight. Who's your daddy? I want to look like my father, God. I want to be like my father, God. Right? I don't want to look like my father, the devil. Right? And so we get to choose too. We get to choose who our father is, and we get to decide if we're going to become more Christ-like or the opposite. You know, how do we do that? We get to grow as His children and His disciples. And He told us in the beginning of this section of the reading today how to be his disciples to continue in his word and that's how he grows us and so that's it i don't want to go too long over my time i know i could and i got stuck i knew that was going to happen i wrote down a lot of things for the last part but i knew also that you were going to share this Liz and I uh, did this morning, like she said, I texted her because I was like, oh, this is so good. And I was really praying for you guys that you would like be able to read and like start to hear some things. Because if you look back at verse 31, everyone look back there really quick. Lauren did like she helped you understand that God is not interested really in believers, right? Because even the demons believe is what the word of God says. What he's interested in is people who want to be disciples, which are learners, followers, people that want to discipline their lives after him, right? And we've all disciplined our lives after something. Like you could talk about the different things that sort of were the center of your life that you sort of did, like the worship disorder, like whatever was the most important to me. But in this first verse, it says, if, right? It says, if you remain faithful, what's the word faithful mean? If I said, define faithful. Loyal. Loyal. Committed. Committed. What else? Yeah, steadfast, loyal, true, right? True to the original is what it says. And unswerving adherence to something, right? Just goes on and on, steady. Um, you remain faithful, you keep your promise, right? That's what you want in a marriage. You want to be, you want someone who's going to be faithful to you, right? He said, if you remain faithful to my word, right? Which means his teachings and to him, because he's the word. If you remain faithful, then what? Then what does it say? Then you're a what? You're a true disciple. So he kind of talks about the difference between true and not true. So in college, I took this class called Logic. I don't know why, because I what, but it says, if this, then this. So if you're a true disciple, then I will follow God's teachings and his word. I will be loyal to them. I will be steadfast to him. I will be honorable with him, right? But then there's this other part that that's the opposite. If I am not following his word, then what? Then I'm not a disciple. So there's this group of people that loves to say, I am, I am. And that's what happens right here. They're like, that's who we are. And he's like, yeah, but you're not living like it. Like three times in the word today, they're like, we're this. We think we are. We follow Abraham. We go to church. And he's like, 
but you're not because you don't recognize me. You don't listen to me. You don't do. And then they're like, we believe in the law. And they're like, but you don't because <laughs> you say you do, but you don't live like it. Right. And so that perspective, and she shared it, sometimes we think we is <laughs> because we say the words. Okay. Pastor Ken in Maine, stealing it from him. Three kinds of people. Those that is, those that ain't, and those that think they is but ain't, right? It's funny, but you don't forget it. True disciple, not a disciple. I think I am, but I'm not, right? And you can tell by the way someone lives and what they look like. And she did talk about that. And, and again, she talked about freedom and surrendering to truth. Knowing truth is really what sets you free. And I did a whole thing on that too. But I really want you to see that she does. And I did it too. I laugh because I listened to her teach. I did. I went through my thing and I wrote, here's what a true, not a slave, but a child of God, a, a son of God looks like right? And here's what God the Father looks like. And I made my little list. And here's what Satan is. And here's what a child of his does. Doesn't hear the Lord, loves to do evil, listens to lies, is a liar. Like if Satan's talking to you, he's lying. Like if his lips are moving, you know those people, right? They, don't, they can't tell that he's, it's not in him and he's a murderer and his desire is to kill, steal, and destroy so God's really trying to say, I'm offering you freedom. I'm offering you not to be a slave, but to be a son. It's going to require you to let my spirit help you be born again. Choose to be a follower, not in perfection, but moving in that direction. Right? So I wrote at the top here. You know, I did write, who's your daddy? Because it always makes me go like, I never thought I was serving Satan when I was, and that I was his puppet, I just thought I wasn't thinking about God. But God's word says you're either for me or you're against me. Uh, you're either a child of God or you're, he's your daddy, right? And so that's hard. I don't want to serve him. I don't want to look like him. I wouldn't want to date him, right? Although I did, you know. And he's just like, hey, I want to, and I want to start being faithful to the Lord and to his word. And that will equal freedom. And it's hard to get your brain around, but I promise you it's true. I wouldn't still be doing it if it wasn't, right? I also wrote, here's what you claim, um, but here's how you can tell. And God was real clear in here that a true, real, legitimate disciple, you'll be able to see it, right? If I told you that I believe in the vegetarian lifestyle, that I've made a decision after I've done some research that that's true, that's right, but all I ever did was eat Big Macs, would you believe that I believed in it? No, because my actions would demonstrate something different. So if I'm saying I'm a disciple, I believe that he's God, I believe in his word, I believe that this is truth, I may not know how to get there, but you should see me be starting to go, okay, I'm going to stop eating Big Macs, <laughs> going to throw some tofu in there or something, I'm just kidding. But I just want you to see this because it's really a really little powerful section and you could like one of the things we're going to do is ask yourself questions like what's faithful me what's unfaithful right i i did the opposite today just for fun what's unfaithful look like anyone know what unfaithful is anyone had someone be unfaithful to them disobedient disobedient what else deceiving lies cheating, cheating. a cheater a cheater <laughs> Right. And so do I want to be Selfish. unfaithful to the God that I'm saying? I, I don't like, I don't like that when it happens to me and I don't want to be that. That's why we always tell you, don't enter into this decision lightly. If you're going to say, God, some of you just got baptized here. God, I, I don't want to just be a believer. I want to be a disciple. I want to be a follower. I'm not going to do it perfect, but I want to walk in that. I want to be moving in that direction. I'm going to start to align my thinking and my behavior 
with your word, right? And so it's pretty cool. I do, I same verses. We're sort of the same people. <laughs> I wrote down Romans 6, right? I wrote down, you're going to be a slave to something, right? God said it. Bob Dylan said it. Like, you're going to either serve God or you're going to serve self or something else. You get to choose who you serve. One will lead to freedom and one will lead to. So those are just my thoughts. All right, Lord, thank you for sharing. Um, do you want to pray for us? Are you there? Lord, thank you 